Hello, good morning and welcome to Ireland AM on Virgin Media 1 and Virgin Media Player. It's great to have you with us this morning. It is Thursday the 4th of April. Weather not so wet this morning, hopefully, and lots more to come on today's show. That's Derek's gig. Sorry. He's doing that in a while. Like, he's uh, mad it's to probably, do Derek's gig. They'll send you out someday. It's pouring rain around the rest of Ireland this <laughs> morning. But went, it didn't rain on me today. Here it is. Now, coming up, waiting lists, huge fees, and no facilities for children under one. We'll be diving into the country's childcare crisis. That's coming up at 7.15. Yes, absolute chaos. Uh, we have invited another panel of Ireland AM viewers to give us their opinion on this week's news stories from housing to hygiene. We've got it all covered. It's going to be very entertaining at 7.35. Yes, and we're sticking with childcare and parents because there's a lot of people on holidays this week. We're wondering if uh, parents should get priority when booking annual leave. So Absolutely. should they be getting the dibs on school holidays? And those no. people who don't have kids... Should we talk? Listen, you take holidays whenever you want, so I don't know what you're... <laughs> like, he's like, I'm going off tomorrow. And you get it for half price. So we're just thinking, <laughs> should you be taking dibs? Should they be allowed if you're a parent to go, sorry, you're child free? No holidays for you. 0896 111 one. We'll be talking about that at 8.15. Oh, it's going to stir a nice up argument on that one. I don't take holidays uh, for What else have we got today, Mr Hughes? But I do think it is Oh, very... here we go. I know, here but we I go. do. I think we're literally Easter, so the parents of the kids, do they get preference? And, and do employers give them the preference? Well, this is oh, what we're asking, yeah. and mm. we're going to find out. Now, see? Now, <laughs> plenty to come on today's show, including some naughty knocky in the kitchen. Yeah, Alberto's over there. He's always naughty and uh, we're going to be showcasing some homegrown Irish brands plus we'll be sitting down with best-selling author Carmel Harrington that's coming up a little later on now Derek is getting his steps in the morning he's a long way away in County Tipperary good morning Derek <laughs> getting the steps up is right Al and following our trip to Cork yes here we've landed here in Tipperary this morning now it is a showery start to the northwest elsewhere wholly mainly dry and settled but once again that case of rinse and repeat with more showers up for Munster uh, later on today some of those heavy and persistent for time as well so we're not out of the woods just yet now care in the Premier County is where we've landed here this morning not only famed for its beautiful castle uh, right behind me here but also for St Declan's Way it's a pilgrim path that runs through the town here so we're going to be meeting up with some of the local community ahead of Pilgrim Path Week. So that's all to come here, live for Tipperary, right across the morning. And guys, check out the geese here, just along the embankment, nestled in, snug as a bug in a rug. <laughs> Waking up here this morning, isn't that a wonderful sight? Hello. <laughs> Amazing, Derek. Yeah, delighted to be woken up by yourself this morning, of yes, course. Yes, Derek, did you hear Tommy's weather report there at the top of the show by any chance? Look, did you do any good? I did. Yeah, well, Tommy, Tommy, you did a great job. There's a role there for you. Thank you very much, Derek. Derek's like, can I come into the studio? Rain, sleet, not snow, to go you're going to be out in it. Like I said, it's nice and dry down in Tipperary as well. Thank you, Derek. We'll catch up with you a little bit later on. Time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Time, the headline there. Activity of ex-soldiers in Libya referred to on guard the Shia Khana. Alleged breaches of a UN arms embargo on Libya by former Defence Forces members have been referred to the guards in the wake of Tónis Samihol Martin describing the re revelations as deeply shocking. Seven more wage rises to bring salary of highest paid civil servant to 326,000. The salary of the highest paid civil servant, Robert Watt, is set to rise well above 300,000 euro. The Secretary General of the Department of Health is currently being paid uh, 290,000 a year. And that is the front page of the Irish Independent. The examiner's front page, over 65s pay 43% more for health insurance. Over 65s are paying an average of 43% more for private health insurance than they were just one year ago, pushing their average to over €2,100. Euro. This is according to a new report. The sun goes with, I hope and pray they are at peace. A dad paid tribute to his soulmate wife, Una, and two gorgeous girls, Kira and Source Saoirse after they were killed in a crash. A eulogy read at their funeral, David Bowden said that the best is to hope and pray they're at peace. The Mirror has this story as well, their headline. My girls all gone in one go. Devastated, David Bowden said he lost his whole family in one go as his girls, Kira and Saoirse, were laid to rest in his wife Una's father's hometown of Repoe, County Donegal. The Herald leads with Katie died days after panic attack diagnosis. A young woman who collapsed at home with pulmonary embolism three days after being discharged from hospital had been diagnosed as suffering only a panic attack. 
Teachers say no to Catholic barrier. Teachers have railed against the Catholic Church's control of primary schools and want the, quote, religious certificate required to be abolished. This is the top story on today's Daily Mail. And finally, the Daily Star goes with taking the pierce. Supermax social media platforms were suspended after GAA headquarters threatened legal action over the fast food giant's April Fool's joke, where they posted an image of renamed Supermax Pierce Stadium in Galway. Is that worth legal action? <laughs> ah, it's it's April, April Fool's, Fool's joke. Uh, oh. Lighten up. Anyway. I never <laughs> no one was paying attention to Monday. It was bank holiday. Anyway, uh, coming up, we've got three year waiting lists and a lack of crash places. They are leaving parents all across the country in dire yeah, straits. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to be talking about the pressure of securing childcare after this short break. Welcome back. Now, a recent Irish independent survey of creches nationwide found that less than 35% of areas across the country, country even have creche places available. Yeah, join us now to discuss the struggles of childcare in Ireland. You just got crunchies on the um, brain. It's <laughs> Easter time <laughs> Easter, in sorry. Ireland. Is journalist with the Irish Independent, Dara Nolan, alongside blogger and parent Louise Cooney. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Um, Dara, uh, this has got a lot of attention this week. 220 creches surveyed across the country. What were the main findings? I suppose the big thing that jumped out to us really was the lengths of the waiting lists. And what we found really was that if you were a parent that was trying to book a place now for this year, for say the coming September, total write off. You know, you're not going to have any luck with that. And at best, you're looking at September 2025 onwards. So and that's 17 months. 17 much months from down now, the line, yeah. That's the earliest. So the thought of trying to get yourself back into the workplace in nine months, a year, there's just no chance. Oh, you're definitely putting it off seemingly, yeah. And then places as well, a lot of them 2026. And then the very worst that we found then was County Monaghan, um, where people couldn't get a place until 2027. So that's, you know, three years down the line. So you really have to be looking really, really far in advance. And another thing that jumped out at us as well, um, one of the other reporters called a crash in Dublin and was told, oh, we're only taking um, onto our waiting list uh, babies that are born in February 2025. Now, keeping in mind that that call was made in oh February God. of this year, that child hasn't been conceived yet, which really, you know, that gives you a snapshot of oh how bad the God. situation is, you know? I'm that sorry if you're, if you're accidental you're, and you're not paying attention to your <laughs> cycle, I don't know. Uh, Louise, Jude is what age now, your baby? He's nearly five months. He's nearly five months mm, old. So yeah. what's your situation with childcare? So, like, it's my first baby. I had yeah. so much to learn and my friends kind of gave me the heads up, you need to get on this. Yeah. So I was probably four months pregnant when I started applying, calling places. We, were, we hadn't even moved yet and I was applying in a new area I didn't know. So it's kind of a standard procedure. You fill out the form. I applied to everywhere I could find. A lot of places didn't come back to me. I got one place that came back and said, we're full, waiting list is closed. Or sorry, that was two places that said that. And then another place offered me a spot for November this year, and that was June last year. So that's a year and a half later. But I had to pay an 800 euro deposit at the time. Didn't know the area, didn't know the crash. So I wasn't really comfortable doing that. We have a spot for July 25. So that's, he'll be a year and a half, more than a year and a half at that stage. July 2025. And you were a month after, you know, people start traditionally telling people at three months mm. and you're going around looking for crash places for your baby. I mean, I was, I was probably just a little bit anxious and like, you know, there's so much you have to figure out. I was like, this is another thing, you know? Wow. It could, because exactly, it's such a, a tough time for new parents. It's a whole roller coaster trying mm, to get yeah. used to that. But then having this weight on top of and pressure trying yeah. to sort, because you'll want to go back to work potentially. Mm. And also, you don't know where you're going to be living or with mm -hmm. the rent, like you can't buy a house close to where creches are. So you could be traveling to the other side of the city or country. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I suppose you have to look outside of your area as well. Um, but I'm lucky in the sense that my parents okay. and my partner's parents, they don't live in Dublin, so that's another factor. Mm. But they've been traveling to kind of help me out when I need it. Uh, he's still small, so I'm at yeah. home most of the time. But like, say if I need to get some work done because I'm self-employed yeah. and I didn't get maternity leave, if I need to get work done, 
my mom has been great. She's actually at home with him now. It just worked out this morning that I was able to come in. Brilliant. Um, but yeah, like if you don't have that, what do you do? And, and your partner thing. Mark as well. Like it's mm -hmm. a huge pressure on him too. Yeah, it is. Like it's busy. You know, it is yeah. because he has to kind of try and help me out to get work done when he's not working, which is, you know, it's just... We'd love to hear from people this morning, 0896 111 And as Dara said there, you were talking about in Monaghan places, 2027 is the time. Three West years Mead from as now. well now. It's not just West Monaghan, Mead as isn't well. it? Is that due to lack of places or that there's a baby boom? It's, it's lack of places. It's, so lack it, of creches. It's, well, it's a huge pressure that's being put on the sector, I suppose. There's just... You know, whether it's down to there being more kids than people are expecting or whether it's down to the amount of places not being enough. And a lot of crashes have been under so much financial pressure that they've had to close. That's been a big thing right across the country as well. So really what we found from the crash managers and the crash owners that we spoke to as part of this investigation was that there's just not enough funding in place uh, for a lot of crashes just to get by and a lot of these places that are just ran by individuals aren't making a lot of money. Yeah. The margins are quite thin. And then the staff retention as well comes into that too. And uh, Jackie Gleeson, who's a, who's a who's a crash owner in, in County Offaly that one of the other reporters, Laura, spoke to as part of this, what she said was that in July and August, when the summer months come and the creches close, the funding runs out and then the staff are let go. And a lot of them move on, they become SNAs, they become primary school teachers. And it's because the money is better and it's because the job is more secure. And then even for people that do stay in that sector, the wages are quite low. You know, the minimum wage for a, for someone working in early childcare is only 13 euro an yeah. hour. It's not a much higher than the regular minimum wage. The two stories that were in the paper this week as well was about uh, how a lot of these creches don't have baby rooms because the amount of staff that you need to yeah. have in baby rooms has, I think it's one staff member for every two kids. And also the disparity in the price of childcare in certain areas. I think Monaghan is one of the lowest where Dublin is the highest. So there's a difference of 1,200 euro. Is that right? Yeah, so... I suppose you can put a lot of that difference down to you know higher cost of living areas. I'm sure it won't surprise anybody that the highest cost areas for crashes were. But that's a uh, massive difference. It, it is a huge, over a grand. It, it is a huge difference, yeah. And you can only partially put it down to you know higher rents, higher cost of living, and higher rates. And then I think you really have to start to question where is that difference coming in? And mm. and like you said, that's a great snapshot I think in Monaghan where they have the worst of the waiting list problem, but the least of the cost problem. So. You know, you might have one issue, but you, you don't yeah. have the other. And then in terms of the baby rooms, the pressure that that's putting on parents, yeah. really, you know, it's, you know, from that point where you need that childcare in the six months to a year window, yeah. what people are saying is that's really delaying mothers, and it is mostly mothers, sometimes fathers as well, getting back to work yeah. for that six months. And you did say in your in your piece that creches were trying to be so accommodating all over the place, like really trying to work. Because, mm -hmm. Louise, we're living more and more sure. in the gig economy where yeah. a lot of people are freelancers yeah. these mm -hmm. days, where they're in your sort of situation. Yeah. So planning is just very hard. Yeah, I have to sit down and like really look ahead and say, right, when can I when can I get this done? You yeah. know, because I don't I, I don't have a childcare set up now until July 25. So I'll have to look at getting maybe a childminder or a nanny or sharing that with a neighbour or something like that. I know there's Facebook groups there that, that yeah. you know, people kind of promote their services. So that's kind of my plan for now, but it's not in place yet. Yeah, yeah. I, it's a, such a difficult situation. You're lucky as well. You have family mm -hmm. as well that can help by what there's so yeah. many people around the country 100%. who are not able to do that. Which you is great. Yeah, yeah, he, he is, he is. Lionel, <laughs> that's exactly good. Yeah. Look after him too. Uh, 0896 111, get in touch with us. Uh, what's the situation like mm. in your area? We'd love to get some text through on this um, because I imagine it's uh, an issue affecting so many people out there. Uh, Darren Nolan with the Irish Independent, great to have you with us, Dara. Thanks so much. And Louise Cooley, influence, entrepreneur and parent. Thank you. And you. thanks to your mummy. Thank mommy. you so much. <laughs> thanks. It's so good. Much. Thanks to your mum. Shout out this morning. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Cheers. Coming up, uh, we're going to be discussing the week's news stories with a panel of Ireland AM viewers. Yeah, back here very shortly.
You're very welcome back. Now, we love hearing your views from all the texts, emails we get every morning. So we have invited some viewers in to discuss the week's news stories. Alan is over in the kitchen with our lovely panel over there. We have Annie, Dean and Chris. Thank you so much for coming in this morning. Uh, we will be talking to you in just a few minutes. But before we do that, we've got News Talks. Andrea Gilligan here to take us through some of the stories. Good morning, Andrea. Morning. Lovely How to have you. you. According to the ESRI... We're all living in houses that are too big. What's yeah, going on with this the story? The gaps are just too big in Ireland. In fact, two-thirds of us, according to the uh, Economic and Social Research Institute, are living in houses that are just too big for our needs. And aside from that, not only are we living in houses that are too big, Marin, we have too few people living in them. Oh. That's the other element of this. So what they've done is they've compared the housing units in Ireland with other um, European countries. And like the average housing unit in Ireland has about five and a half, 5.5 rooms. Yeah. By comparison, what? yeah, to other EU norms of... 3.7 rooms. So I suppose, look, a lot of this really, when you look at it, comes down to really societal norms. Like it is just sort of the done thing in Ireland that if you live in an urban area, you probably live maybe in a three bed semi D. If you live beyond uh, the M50, more than likely you're living in a 1980s four bed bungalow. Like, and a lot of us will know anecdotally that when you go and you, you know, you maybe buy a house, if you ever tell somebody who's not living in Dublin that you live in a one or a two bed, I know in my own experience, you're often told you live in a very small house. That like that is how people view it. And it's a sort of, a, it's just a societal, mm. um, perhaps expectation in Ireland that we tend to live in, you know, right. the three bed, semi-D with the back garden. And that is why we now have houses that are too big and we've got too little people living in them. asking people to downsize as well. There's nowhere to open up the story. The well, let's, uh, to move to. let's uh, get uh, the views of the panel. Alan, what do you reckon? Yes, thank you. As you said, that we, Annie, Dean and Chris are here with us this morning. Now, Annie, I know you've travelled a lot, so that, that your housing situation is not the same as many uh, here in Ireland, but your friends, would they have experienced that, that they are trying to downsize and just can't find anywhere else? Uh, we have talked about this as well as part of the University Third Age Group. Um, the problem there is that Ireland, you know, you used to have big families, mm. and so you'd find that's the family home and all the kids left. Yeah. So the parents or the one parent is there, and the, they often come back, the children, with their grandchildren. So therefore, they say, well, we still need the space. Uh, the other side is that even when they want to downsize, there isn't the choice yeah. there. Where do they go? Yeah. Um, but the other positive side of houses with extra rooms, and I use it in the, uh, my part-time job that I'm using, is a lot of people, uh, we, we place students to do three months work experience and we look for accommodation. And we find a lot of people who are retired who have extra bedrooms mm -hmm. and they rent it out for three months. So yeah. that's a little bit of a use. And, and you can get some use out of it there. Yeah, exactly. Dean, I mean, as a student, I mean, this accommodation obviously comes <laughs> up an awful lot. Oh, yeah. But do you hear about this? Like, are students actually worried about moving out and doing some and trying to get accommodation and trying to get houses? Even we're talking about down the line that your house might be too big for you. You can't yeah. even find a house. I mean, I see people my age see stories like this and you kind of scoff. It's just bewilderment. We can't really understand it because, <laughs> you know, I'm in the generation, generation rent. Two thirds, I mean, two thirds of people apparently are living in houses that are too big for them. Two thirds of people between 25 and 29 are still living with their parents. Mm -hmm. Do you know, it's, it's ridiculous. We're, we're, we're trapped in this cycle of, I mean, I'm, I'm the president of Students' Union, University of Galway. We have hundreds and, and up to thousands of people commuting every day, commuting for hours and hours and hours. They can't get a place to live. Yeah. Even when they get a place to live, they're living in unsuitable accommodation. Yeah. We mm. deserve it at the start of our academic year. Three weeks into the academic term, 10% of our students were still in unsuitable accommodation or they had no accommodation at all. Like, in the, a few weeks in, in, in the academic term, they're living in hostels, they're sleeping on friends' couches. Yeah. I've spoke to a, a, a student, one fellow, who was driving eight hours every day. Eight to hours? From Carlo. No. Yep. I mean, so we see stories like this, and yeah. we, it's kind of... There's a bit of a detachment, I think, between my generation and... and, mm. and yeah. Of, yeah, like so. Chris, like, for, for people like that, well, you just must feel for them as well, because they are in a, in a, a big house, the family have left, and we got texts in from people going, well, there's nowhere else to go. Yeah. We can't find anywhere. No, like, um, I, I, we're very lucky. We bought our house in 2019. Um, we have two kids, Ollie and Cullen. Um, but, like, we're so lucky that we bought then because, uh, like, after mm. COVID, the, the, it was a boom in prices. Where did you in, buy it? In Clondalkin. In Clondalkin. Yeah. And is it that so, your, your typical three bed? It's a four bed. It's a we're four very, bed. We're very lucky we got a four bed house. But, like, when we retire, we're not going to look to downsize to 
a one or a two bed just because we have the extra bedrooms. Like, yeah. You know, people work very hard for what they have. And they want, so, you'd want to keep that. Yeah, you want to keep that. And then that. obviously and then you the want garden to... and you know, all that, yeah. So that's so. your forever home, you yeah, say? Yeah, Okay, <laughs> well, there you go. That's our view for the moment. Back over to you guys. Very, very interesting. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that panel. Great spread of different opinions on it as well. 0896 111 Great spread. Opinion. He's looking at the food at spread over there. Oh, what's going on. Don't be touching the pastries. <laughs> uh, right, next story. Uh, listen, we were all queuing up to try and get tickets for Coldplay and Taylor Swift uh, a few months ago. The gigs are coming to town and the gig gouging now for prices has gone to an extortionate level, particularly for Taylor Swift tickets. Oh, listen, Taylor Swift last year was just the most sought-after concert in Ireland, not to mention, um, or you talked about Co or Coldplay and Stevie Nicks only last week. Like, yeah. We were talking about it on the show. Like I remember speaking to listeners on the programme who, you know, just felt nearly exploited in many cases. Like, where you've been asked to pay 160 euro for a standing ticket. Some people telling me that they got two standing tickets yeah. for the guts of about 400 quid. Like when you talk about Taylor Swift, Tommy, like she was here in 2015 and tickets at the time were 80 quid. Those yeah. very same tickets for Taylor Swift um, this coming June are now at 250 euro a pop. So like people are now looking about travelling abroad. You even try to get accommodation in Dublin. You would be as easy to get five days in Dubai as it will but in many 200, cases. But 200 and that's to buy them legit. Now actually on the, the market, third the party. resale, yeah. they're yeah. over €3,000. Exactly, on a third-party website, and this is for tickets for Taylor Swift, um, which is more than what it would cost for actually for you, really for about five days to nearly a week if you were to and head And there was a lot of pressure on parents to get these tickets. Hugely, you know, because Taylor Swift in particular really appeals yeah. to that really much, you know, kind of the teenage, younger audience. She's huge on TikTok, huge on social mm. media. She's an awful lot of, of younger people um, looking to go to her gig. I should yeah. say, younger people. I yeah. was dying to go to her, yeah. to her, her gigs yeah. as well, trying to get tickets, but they're huge But this is yeah. everywhere. It's from sporting uh, events all the way through to concerts and things that are going on so expensive in Ireland. Let's find out what our news panel think. Alan. Yeah, well, Dean, you had some friends who were desperate to get. <laughs> Did they get them in the end, the Taylor Swift tickets? They got them, yeah, thankfully, or else we would have a rough year in the office. Uh, <laughs> it, but uh, the way I look at it, like, there's two issues here. So first of all, it's the initial prices. In Ireland, I think the prices are far above the rest of Europe for especially this concert. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you have the gouging. Uh, so I can't imagine, I mean, fair, that story came out this week, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Taylor Swift is the first billionaire, billionaire singer. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what's going on? She's a, the first billionaire singer. She's made the most money out of singing. Look, fair play to her, she's a fantastic artist. I'm a big fan of her music. But to charge those prices know, initially... Like, is she charging it because, Chris, is it up to the promoter? Is it up to the artist or is it up yes. to promoter to try and cap this and go, look, you can't be paying, you shouldn't be paying more than this and try and stop it? I think the artists need to step in because they're... You think as a billionaire, Taylor yeah, Swift should well, step they're, in? And they're go, in that position do. because of the fans. Like, And now, I don't know if they they fall out of touch with their fans in the end when they're billionaires. Mm. And, but they really, I think the artists need to step in and then obviously the third party websites as yeah. well, they probably need to get rid of them because that's where Clamp the problem is. That. Like 200 euro for a ticket is expensive, but then when it gets up to the thousands, then the artists really need to step in. I think. Annie, were you online trying to get your Taylor no, Swift tickets? No, I was not. No. <laughs> I, as I said, I went to the Rolling Stones concert back in the 70s in Hyde How Park in London. In Hyde Park, much was um, that ticket? I, I think, actually, it could have been free because it was open air. <laughs> so, you know, I can't remember if you're paying for it. I just went very early and sat down on the grass and away we went and it was when Mick Jagger let out all the butterflies. Oh, you know, right, dressed yeah. in you white. were there. I was there. Were you yes. in your big flurry long dress no, as well? Uh, no, uh, no. Uh, just no, no. <laughs> I, heard afterwards, you... I heard afterwards somebody had, uh, had actually... A child was born during the concert. Really? Yeah, a pregnant lady, yeah. And I was there, and I went home. My parents were telling me, and I said, well, I didn't see anybody doing for the baby. <laughs> well, I'm <laughs> sure there's thousands of people there. I'm sure but there's listen, a few conceptions yeah, at that but, concert but as well. This, con <laughs> this concept of the money, I'm sorry, guys, but we're back again to the whole profit situation. Yeah. And this isn't necessarily the singer at all or the artist. This is some... Uh, organization that's breaking in a load of money because that's what they're after. They're after profit. Yeah. And they'll up, up, up the prices mm -hmm. because people are willing to pay. But I think that's a hell of a lot of strain to put on families. It is. It, and especially, as you say, when, when children are dying to go to the concert yeah. and they're, they're saying, I want to go and see Taylor yeah. Swift. And you have to say no. Listen, thanks for the moment very much. Uh, we'll be back to you after this short break.
You're very welcome back. Our news panel is still with us. So let's get straight to the next story. We can see teachers at the front of a lot of the papers today and this week. One of the stories is the ASTI has voted to resist leaving cert reform amid widespread concern over the impact of artificial intelligence. Tell yeah. us more, Andrew. So the government plans at the moment to increase the marks that are allocated or awarded for leaving cert students um, who are, you know, carrying out the continuous assessment, yeah. the project kind of work that you do and not just at the the, the leaving cert examination mm. day. The plan at the moment is to increase that in some subjects from about 20 to 40%. We're, we're on the Easter breaks at the moment. Um, a lot of the teacher conferences are taking place across yeah. the country. The ASTI, which is one of the biggest trade unions representing secondary school teachers, they met yesterday in Wexford. And what they voted to do, they voted against this plan to increase the allocated marks for continuous assessment to 40%. And ultimately, their big concern here is that students from more... Um, basically affluent families that are well resourced in in many cases um you know that that they would have now you would actually widen that social divide that would often exist within the classroom because of the supports that they would have available even access to different levels of artificial intelligence and different apps and and you know resources because an as awful well. lot of these are it's not open ai they're behind paywalls so Absolutely. you're saying that so this could be on the computer and kids could be using, using these, this be able to, to complete their better projects. resources and and of course that now is could potentially contribute to 40% of your you know leave and serve marks in a given subject that yeah. is one element i suppose of their concern but like artificial intelligence as you know well it's a huge talking point at the moment and until really a lot of these areas are kind of teased out. The ASTI so have voted against just it. Just resistant to change. Yeah, you could that. have, um, we had an artificial intelligence Tommy Bowen here just a little while ago. You <laughs> could have him in your classroom. And maybe it's the someday. way the world is going, so it why is. not embrace it anyway? But if they don't have the structures in to do that. Alan, over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, Annie, Dean and Chris are still with us here. And Dean, obviously as a student, mm. you, every student is embracing AI. Is it, is it something that we should be embracing or something we should fear? I think we should, we should embrace it. Um, just, like, I'm a qualified secondary school teacher myself, so when I see things like this, when the ASTI are saying that um, putting more continuous assessment would widen the social divide, I think having you know, certain subjects so dependent on an exam at the end of the year really widens the social divide because some students don't perform well in exams, they have the time or the resources to go to grinds, to do all these extra things, to speak more to higher education because AI is the buzzword in higher education mm -hmm. at the minute. Um, and a lot of universities are doing really good work, a lot of universities are kind of completely shunning it. I think these, this sort of, these sort of measures that completely kind of put it to one side are just doing us a disservice because AI, don't get me wrong, it has its flaws, has its faults. But as Mirren said, the structures need to be put in place to, to to mitigate those flaws yeah. and to work in, in, with it. Exactly. Mm. It has advantages, especially in computer science and fields like that, where it can cut out some so much tedious and monotonous work and it can allow people the time to do other projects. There's so many benefits, but the structures have to be put in place. So I think this move by the ASDI kind of steps away from embracing it and putting in those structures which are added work and just completely shunning it. I don't think it's a good move. And Chris, I mean, you have two children, they'll be growing up. Do you think it's a good idea to get assessments? Do you think there should be more assessments throughout the year? because people might just like crumble at the exam stage. Yeah, well, for me being in secondary school, I know like, having one big exam at the end of the leaving cert, that, was, that didn't suit my way of learning. Mm. But when I was in college, I prefer, I was much better with, with, the, with assessments. the essays and the assessments that suited my way. Like I didn't have, like some people might, if you have a really good memory, uh, an exam yeah. suits you at the end yeah. of the year yeah. and you can just put everything down, but that just didn't suit my way of learning. So I did much better in college and I enjoyed college. Much More better than, than the school, than the, the than pressure the school. of those exams and yeah. just everything yeah. focusing on those results. Yeah. Annie, what do you think? Do you think right. we should be embracing yeah. AI? I think there's two things here. One, I, th I thoroughly agree with the idea of doing assessment during the year because a lot of people are under pressure at the exams. Yes. And again, they can't always afford grinds. Yeah. However, I'd be very careful of AI as well. We need to look at it because we've just gone through the whole process of social media, Facebook, um, all the other social media uh, that started off thinking, oh, this is great. And now we have all these problems of people been stalked and of bullying mm. and all kinds of issues that have been created but do you, that we you do agree that for. assessment is a good thing? I think is assessment good is good, but check the AI and what you're using it for. OK, back up to you guys. Thank you very so much, guys. Again. Very interesting what Chris is saying there, that he just did better in college when it was assessment. We're moving Same. on right. to something else. Sniff test, you smell lovely. How are you smelling? <laughs> How are you smelling today? Pretty good. I showered this morning. Oh, did you shower this time? morning? Well yes, yes, like, yes, like most other people in the country, but unlike not, Jonathan Ross. Unlike Jonathan Ross. Yeah, what's going yeah, on? The chat show host um, basically has said, you know, that he 
heat shower is once a week or less. And he doesn't see there's any need or think there's any need to do so. His wife as well, scriptwriter Jane Goldman, um, also goes days at a time without showering. But it has reignited the debate about how often should people shower and how often do you get in under the well, water. Well, it's a water shortage out there. Maybe yeah. this is what we should all be doing. <laughs> Alan, what do you think? <laughs> Chris, shower every day? I have a shower every day. Yeah. If I went to, if I, if I went a week without a shower, I'd probably be thrown out of the house. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I'd be like, and it certainly wouldn't, I wouldn't be admitting to it either. If I did. <laughs> <laughs> you, do, you do the cold shower. You do the cold bath. Really? Yeah, yeah. On cold. Well, that's what I did this morning. Is I had a cold shower to wake me up. Oh, because excellent. I was getting up early this morning. But um, I suppose Jonathan Ross's wife does the same, so yeah. they're both smelly together. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. Do you shower every day? Oh, Jesus, yeah, I'd have to. <laughs> <laughs> and look, like, each to their own, and if he's not hurting anyone or if he's not smelling too bad, fair enough, but I'd like to talk to some of his friends and his wife <laughs> and see what... I wouldn't like to be stuck in a lift with him or, like, or well, well, beside him in the pub for too long. Well, that say, but, Annie, is that the thing, though? If he's not smelling and he just wants to shower, like, if he was reeking, that's one thing. But yeah. if he's not and he just wants well, to shower Well, I reckon it's week. just a public publicity stunt that he just, you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity. And I reckon he's all, what can I say to make my yeah. name out there more? I don't think Jonathan <laughs> Ross needs a bit of publicity. No, no, I'm but, only I mean, but what yeah. do you think in general of people who just... Uh, so well, I, they uh, say that you can overclean yourself yeah, in the oil that's true. to go. Well, yeah, my own, my own situation is I do have a skin problem, but my water actually helps mine. Oh, so nice. I have baths with oatmeal uh, that I squeeze in through a mesh and I do like these oatmeal Annie, baths. I wouldn't think, Annie, I wouldn't... I just said that's the type of person you are. <laughs> you have baths with oatmeal. Of course. Of course the Cleopatra you do. bit, you know? <laughs> I'm telling you, Cleopatra has nothing <laughs> on <laughs> you. Listen, Annie, Dean and Chris, thank you yeah. so much thank for you. joining. Baths with oatmeal, there you go. That's the type of viewers we have, guys. So I never fancy. thought uh, I'd have a bath and porridge. <laughs> 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 you can eat so, it while you're having a bath. In the <laughs> <laughs> Throw a bit of honey in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you amazing. to Annie, Dean and Chris. Absolutely wonderful <laughs> views. And that's the sort of text that we get in every day. And we just love it. So we really, really appreciate it. 0896 111 Andrea Gilligan as well from News Talks. Brilliant to have you for that. Thank you Thanks, for joining us. Still to come this morning, should parents get priority when booking annual leave so they can have the same time off as their children? Children, get in contact. It's 0896 111. That's a lot of time. Keep our panel there for that one. Plus, we've got Naki in the kitchen with the wonderful Alberto Rossi. See you after the break. It's time now to take a look at this morning's paper, starting with the Irish Times. The headline there, activity of ex-soldiers in Libya referred to Garda. Alleged breaches of a UN arms embargo on Libya by former Defence Forces uh, members have been referred to on Garda Shia Khanna in the wake of Tanis de Mihal Martin, describing the revelations as, quote, deeply shocking. Seven more wage rises to bring salary of highest paid civil servant to €326,000. The salary of the highest paid civil servant, Robert Watt, is set to rise well above the €300,000. The Secretary General at the Department of Health is currently being paid £290,000 a year. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The Examiner's front page, over 65s pay. 43% more for health insurance. So they're paying an average of 43% more for the private health insurance than they were just one year ago, pushing the average to over €2,100. This is according to a new report. The sun goes with, I hope and pray they are at peace. A dad paid tribute to his soulmate <coughs> wife, Una, and to gorgeous girls, Kira and Sorsha after they were killed in a crash. A eulogy read at the funeral. David Bowden said, the best is to hope and pray that they are at peace. The mayor also leads with this tragic story. The headline there, my girls are all gone in one go. Devastated father David said he lost his whole family in one go as his girls Kira and Saoirse were laid to rest in his wife Una's father's hometown of Repo County, Donegal. Uh, the Herald leads with Katie died days after panic attack diagnosis. A young woman who collapsed at her home with a pulmonary embolism two days after being discharged from hospital had been diagnosed as suffering only a panic attack. 
Teachers say no to Catholic barrier. Teachers have rallied against the Catholic Church's control of primary schools and want the religious certificate required in order to be a teacher in a Catholic school to be abolished. That is the top story on the Daily Mail today. And finally, the Daily Star goes with taking the pierce. Supermax social media platforms were suspended after GAHQ threatened legal action over the fast food giant's April Fool's joke where they posted an image of a renamed Supermax Pierce Stadium in Galway. Of course, that's after the whole uh, controversy, Parky Queeve or whatever else. Yeah. Uh, we have an awful lot of text yes. messages in through this morning. It's a so busy many. old first hour. Yeah. We're going to start off what we're talking about at 7.15 and creches and how difficult it is for people around the country to get their children into creches. Really yeah. amazing. Faye is saying, living in South County Dublin, I called nine places when I was 12 weeks pregnant. I got one place when my baby will be 15 months. I'm due to go back to work at 10 months it's all so stressful. Amy says, my baby is almost five months, a change in circumstances, and we have to find a creche now. Based in Galway, and no one is getting back to us. Those who answered, they say that the waiting list, and she believes them, are full. I need to go back to work. And this is an order for us to be able to buy a house. house. It's an incredibly difficult situation. Uh, and we had, this is from a survey in the Irish Independent, yep. over 200 uh, creches were interviewed over this and the problem is not on the creches. Absolutely they are trying not. their best and no. trying to do it at the price but it's just so difficult out there and there's such a shortage of them. Megan said, I studied an honours degree in early childhood care and education for four years in Sligo a few years ago. I have a level eight degree, but I left the sector when I realised I could get paid more working in a shop and have a hundred times less stress. stress yeah. From the 80 people in my year in college, I know only a handful who stayed in the sector. So this is it. Like there's no there's money the in the money crash. There. There's no money for the people who are working in it. And unless you're a massive organisation who runs multiple crashes, there's no money there's for money them either. There's money somewhere though. If people are paying 1,200. So where's the money but going listen, to? Is exactly. it insurance? Is it everything going up Well, we were costs? talking to a journalist here before who said in some crashes they are they are minting it. And other but the ones that are able to combine the services because the amount of paperwork and everything goes into it. But I know I pay a fortune for the creches yeah. for my children, but it's the best money you can pay because the lear early learning development they get, the friendship they get, everything yeah. is wonderful, but it's just so hard to get them. Marie's um, one here, like I have four children, three of them are in creche four times a week. I booked my fourth child in when I was six weeks pregnant. He's now nine months old and I still have no space in the creche. I'm back to work in a week. He's now booked into a childminder. So I've drop offs, three drop offs before I even go to work in the morning to a creche, a childminder, and a school. Can you imagine getting up, trying to organise your family, and doing three drops before you get to your Stress. work? A lot Absolutely. of people in the same situation. Thank um, you. Yeah, and we've got text on housing and loads 0896 111 to get in contact. We'll talk to you in a minute on Ireland. Well, we want to hear about this one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll chat you after the break. Bye. Good morning, you're very welcome back. Now, we are nearing the end of the Easter break. I'm sure a lot of parents will be delighted. And a lot of parents took the time off while their kids were on school holidays. But we are asking if parents should get priority when it comes to booking annual leave over those who don't have children. The word priority, you can feel <laughs> everyone going, excuse me. Joining yeah. us to discuss is Editorial Director of Image Media, Dominic McMullen, and podcaster James O'Hagan. Good morning, how are you? Lovely to have you. Good morning. Thank you both with you us. have children, should you have priority to take <laughs> holidays? Mm. I'm exhausted. Should you, should you <laughs> I had children, I'm exhausted. Should you get priority? when children are on holidays for you to take holidays, Dominic? Like the easy thing, my gut instinct when you asked this question was like, oh no, it should be fair. And then I thought about it for a second and then I thought, yeah, yeah, I should get priority. <laughs> yeah. Because it's not a holiday. No, it's not a holiday. I, someone who is taking their annual leave to go off to a wedding in Italy or to go off and have a bit of fun mm. for a week, you'll have your chance. <laughs> Heaven forbid. <laughs> I am taking annual leave. If I don't take the annual leave, I have to pay someone. I have to, there is financial implications if I don't take annual leave. I have to pay someone to mind my kids. I have to pay for a camp or I have to try and work and pretend that I'm not also parenting. I've never used the mute button so much on my Zoom. 
But there's always financial implications when you decide to have children and the taxpayer covers some of those sometimes with Eki Care. Why in a situation like this does it make sense? Not Eki. Eki's when they're small. No, 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 I get that. But there are, you know, you've decided to have the children and that's kind of the well, decision that you've made. All I'm doing is keeping the human race going, <laughs> Marin. Uh, what do you <laughs> think, James? In a great way. What do you think, James? <laughs> well, look, and I know we were saying, look, we'll keep this piece light, we'll keep this light, but, uh, but I'm going to go fully like workers unite here. <laughs> and I'm going to say <laughs> that the reality is, is that, you know, you know, no one should be made feel that their needs are kind of more expendable than other persons. And I think it really falls to the employers to kind of find a way to build the flexibility yeah. in yeah. to ensure that, you know, kind of parents are able to take the leave they want while people who aren't parents are able to flit off to Ibiza or to whatever wedding or whatever weekend the way they want to. I think that's a so very important thing. you think that for employers, so that means though when an employer has to make a decision that somebody gets priority. Mm. I don't think they need to make a decision. They can, they can, they can have conversations around what the like workplace needs are. Say, for example, we just talked about the the Easter holidays that have come up over the last uh, over the last two weeks. They knew ahead of time that lots of parents had wanted off. So having those conversations earlier in the year about the fact, right? We know that this is going to be a key period of time. What can we do to ensure that everyone who wants to be off is able to get to be off, rather than kind of saying to to me uh, as as a sort of as a child as individual, right? Your needs or what you want to do are, are second secondary now to an individual who, who has children. So I think that, like, you know, it's absolutely, especially more recently, like if you'd asked me about this about 10 years ago, I would have been raging. I would have been like, absolutely not. This is a disgrace. <laughs> but I've softened in my older age. And as, my, as I've seen my friends have children, I understand the amount of extra work and care that's involved, the amount of, um, I suppose, the amount of disruption which children can bring. And it is really important that that mm. flexibility is given, but it shouldn't be at the expense of other people. Mm. And it should be built into the work environment. Yeah, like it's not a holiday. It's not a holiday. <laughs> no, uh, no. Let's take, a, let's take a quick look. We'd love to hear what you think. So we're going to run a poll. You can just scan the QR code and let us know what you think. Should parents get priority when booking time off? We would love to know what you think of um, this one. Because we have texts in on this already. They're flying in. Uh, Derek said, my wife and I do not have kids and feel very strongly that parents should not be given priority. Mm -hmm. We enjoy our holidays and because we don't have kids, can afford good holidays and do. Their problems are, the, are their kids are their problems. <laughs> oh, my God. See, I think people should have a bit of empathy. Don't you think they should have a bit of empathy? Like, mm -hmm. also, they can take holidays. I do think it should be fair, by the way. Of mm -hmm. course it should be fair. Yeah, because we should not workers against each other. Yeah, exactly. Said, yeah. yeah, we've had a great chat back then. <laughs> We're friends now. Yeah. Uh, but it is, like, but it they is... can take holidays whenever they want. Exactly. If you have your children are in school, there are only certain periods that you can take them out. Yeah. Uh, where And those periods are very expensive if you want to yeah. do a summer holiday. Yeah. Yeah, if you want a cheaper holiday to go off to Ibiza or with wherever, no children wherever, running around. with no kids, you could go the week before the Easter holidays or the week after, yeah. you know. Let's bring in something like Christmas. Yeah, right? okay, yeah. As, as some, you know, is it kind of expected, oh, listen, you don't have kids, James. Well, you know, I, you'll, you'll be more available to work at around Christmas. I, I, I think that that certainly is an implication. And people look at a family structure and they say, oh, you know, Christmas is a very child forward Absolutely. holiday. It's, you know, it's kind of what it's all about in some ways. But people have different needs and different family styles and structures in place. And so I, many years ago, would have been working in retail and there would always have been an assumption that kind of the childless people would be the ones who would be scheduled over Christmas. I remember working in one particular shop where sort of when the roster was being made with no engagement with the staff, all parents were given Christmas Eve off and people without uh, without yeah, children not were not. And it meant that individuals who lived off in Cork and Galway and Donegal weren't getting out to hit the roads to get home for Christmas until late on Christmas Eve. Whereas parents who lived nearby in, in, in Dublin city centre were off the day lounging around the place. Well, not lounging around the place, <laughs> minding their children. <laughs> I, I say before I'm cancelled. <laughs> Too oh, late. Too when you said lounging, Alan's laughing, going, yeah, they're lounging, uh, I mean, they're lounging. Yeah, cleaning up the mess <laughs> and that, the chaos. That's an but... interesting point, isn't it, when people have to travel, yeah. uh, especially around times like that, where it is yeah. family, regardless of whether you have children or not. Yeah. That can I be of quite... aging parents, you never know uh, what exactly. people have. Yeah. Yeah, 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 with things like that going on. So yeah. that, I can understand that time around Christmas would be tricky. Yeah, I mean, it should it should be fair. I, I, like, I, I would never deny somebody, you know, Christmas Eve with their family, whether you have kids mm. or not. 
But I think what it goes back to is we're living in a structure and we're working in a structure which isn't designed mm -hmm. for working parents, but or for families where two parents work. Like, yeah. that's what yeah. it all comes back to. Yeah. So we need to tra change the exactly. yeah. And we have a structure. similar situation from the creches. We know how difficult it is yeah. for people to get help. I like this one by Pat. No problem covering a colleague for leave, work, etc. provided they return the favour. And I think mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. Okay. I can recall when I was working, we covered each other, except there was a couple of colleagues who had no issue asking to be covered. But if they were asking for a favour, there was always some excuse. Mm. So I think that that's the big thing. It's compromise that yeah, we cover yeah, each yeah. other. And that's yeah, what a good yeah. working environment is. But I'm yeah. sure it's not always like that. And, and that's kind of to the point that you said that I think is really interesting, James, that it is sort of workers, you know, people on the, they, they put it pit yeah, against each other when you're like, you can kind of sort this out at a management level. Yeah, and I do yeah. think like a lot of people, like having those conversations early in the year about kind of like when are going to be the pinch points when people are going to need holidays and off will allow people to start you know scheduling and planning ahead you know I'm someone who would be you know I, I, I love my job but I live for my holidays so I would be planning right from the beginning of the year when I want to go away oh, and I think thing. other people having those conversations saying well this is midterm this is Halloween we're going to have time off so that they are able to sort of say ahead of time before I've gone down the road of booking or planning look these are times maybe for mm. you to avoid so it doesn't get to a place where a couple of weeks before I'm going away I'm suddenly the worst in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that, like a, bo a, a, a boss that says let's get this done sorted and, and yeah. instead of having to hold off and wait to see if the yes. parents decide last minute that they want to take a time off yeah. over Easter. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. like it is difficult for parents at the yeah. minute to try yeah. and like <laughs> yeah. Easter holidays, it is not a holiday, summer holidays, mm -hmm. like you're always trying, people kind of think that you're lounging around the house. <laughs> But no. and the and reality. When kids get sick as well. Like, do you know what can yeah. you do? Const constant. Yeah. It is. I'm difficult. literally on Zoom meetings. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm just after realising my father worked almost every Christmas day. Chose to. <laughs> I wonder what that says about us. Uh, we were asking on our poll, should parents get priority when booking time off? The results are... Very resounding. No, 77%. Yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. wow. Oh, my yeah. God. Your are coming. Your view, James is like, I'm not yeah. coming. <laughs> Um, I listen, love it. Guys, thank you so much for getting involved in the poll as well. Yeah. James O'Hagan, it's great to have you with Thanks us. And of course, Dominique Thanks, McMullen guys. from uh, Image Media. Great thank to have you, you both thank with you us. Thank so much. Uh, stay with us now. We've lots more here to come on Ireland AM. <laughs> Thanks for staying with us now. It's time for some indulgent Italian food. Yes, no better man. Alberto Rossi is here to fill our bellies. What have we got this oh, morning, Alberto? This morning we have gnocchi alla sorrentina. How do you say it? Gnocchi. 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 Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> You're worn out yeah, after yeah. saying that. Yeah. So yeah. Crazy in the morning. Now, do, are you getting the gnocchi from a packet or are you making the gnocchi? No, you can go and buy it's them. It's Alberto you Rossi. You can go buy them if you feel yeah. like, uh, but I'm making them this morning, okay? Oh, all oh, right. Uh, right. So it is, uh, you can call them potato dumplings if you wish in the way, you know, because gnocchi is too difficult to say. So we put the potatoes in the oven. I put potatoes uh, in the oven, rooster potatoes for about an hour. Rooster potatoes, okay. At 185, 180 degrees. Now okay. I cook them out, then you split them up open, like making mashed potato, and you put them in a ricer. Now, okay. Yeah, like okay. we all have a I ricer know, like this. I have home. a huge one. A masher. Yeah, a mas so it's mas basically yeah. a masher. Yes, so you, like you, if you have the masher that you have at home that you put the potato yeah. and then you clink it like yeah, that, yeah. that's perfect. I okay, so you boil it. a potato. No, you put it in the oven and you bake it. Do you, you uh, do you peel it first? No, you leave it. You take the potato the way it is from the okay, package and, then and you put it in it the oven. Okay. Why didn't you show us all this? Okay. Very good. Right, so what do we do next? And then you put in the ricer and you go like you're making a mashed potato. Okay, so you can see okay. that you have all the potato here, okay? And can oh. I ask you, Alberto, yeah. why would you not just boil it and mash them up now, the way you would if you're making mashed potato? You can boil the potato too, but what happens is the potato will absorb most of the water. Okay. And you want the potato to be as dry as possible. Ah, okay. okay. So you could boil them, but then you have to take them out of the water, put them in the oven to dry a little bit. Oh, right? okay. But what so you it's basically do... mashed potato. Exactly. That you have but, there. Well, it's, just, it's the a first stop of it, yeah. okay? And then you put in uh, melted butter, okay? I you just put eat in that now, like that. One egg yolk. Oh, right? yeah. You this is really interesting because I always see gnocchi and I never knew this. Put is in a little bit right? of salt and then 
some parmesan cheese. So baked, baked potatoes. Baked potato, uh, egg, egg, butter, butter, salt and cheese. cheese. And then uh, in Italy we use a lot nutmeg. Nutmeg, With yeah. potato, okay? And it gives a very specific flavor, you know, because so you grate in a little bit. Now you can buy it already grated too, okay? okay. You can buy the gnocchi yeah. and yeah. the nutmeg already grated. But okay. you're making it fresh. I'm making morning. it fresh. This is what, you know, I, I grew up with my grandmother in Italy making the gnocchi and everything, you know? She'll make them at home and everything. And then you just mix them, okay? Now the it's potato kind of itself, bread, isn't it? It's like pasta. Well, uh, pasta, it, it, I potato did. dumplings, you know, you call yeah. them. It's, uh, okay. you know, you start to mix it like this. Okay, and then we put in some flour. You know, oh, in my case, what, this is just oh, plain here flour. Here we go now. So okay, so this is half a kilo of potato, and you put in about 150 grams of flour. Okay, and then these will start to get all together. You know, you make a nice dough would be the wrong thing because you're not really needing it. But you're it's kind of a it dough, together. right? It's kind of a dough. Okay, so you just keep it all together. It, it takes no time. Okay. Wow. And then you have a nice little. And would they keep for long, Alberto? Uh, I would say if fridge? you if you make them, you cook them, and then you can keep them for a couple of days, you know? Okay. Oh, so once they're cooked. Exactly. Once, once they're cooked, them. you need to use them, you get, okay. me? you get me? And then with the flour, you just... Uh, I put on the recipe, you make a snake, because you take a little bit of the potato yeah. mix, and you... Roll. And now, you're saying is... your granny would be making this. W would different people have their own little recipes? Yes, different indeed. Ways they use different adding, potatoes adding little bits. and everything, you know. But for us, it's like this, you know. You, you do the little snake, okay? okay? Yeah. And then okay. you just cut them in pieces. You know, you can do them like this, so they're like little pillows. And that's okay? it. Yeah. Or otherwise, if you want to do like we do... Roll them. Roll them, oh, and right. then you have a little wooden... Piece that you can make them like this. And, and that's they... the way you see it a lot, isn't it? Exactly. There's a little dent in it. There's a dent, yeah. and that dent helps with the uh, holding the sauce together with the, wow. with the gnocchi, okay? And it, it sounds complicated, but it, it's not, okay? And then what happens is you put them in boiling water with some salt. Okay. You know, and and they that's don't on the high boil, that yes. one. Yes. So... They don't take long to cook because okay. they come up. To well, the they're surface. already cooked, aren't they? Well, well the potato is already potatoes, cooked, but yeah. technically you're cooking their, uh, the, the flour and the potatoes, OK? And how do you know when they're cooked? They come up to the surface, so they float. You oh. turn down the rolling boil, and you can see that they're going to come up. So they will literally just come to the top Yeah, they come ready. up, and that means that they are soft, and they are, they are good enough. And would that be, be good salted water? Look at that. Salted yeah, water with everything you see. Now, okay. as they come up, you pick them up. You have here your tomato sauce. Hence, it's called Alla Sorrentina. Okay. Because Sorrento is the Gulf of Sorrento in Campania, where Naples is. Yeah. Okay. You know, where people want to go, you know. Yeah. And you have Beautiful. the sun, the Naples, and the It was only in Naples basil. a few weeks ago. Ah, wow. it's beautiful, isn't it? You know, it's magical. What you do then, once you have it all mixed up, you put it inside uh, one dish oven, one oven so, dish. So, sorry, that pasta sauce then, is that, or that's yeah, it's, uh, it's basic. just passata, like, is it? As, as I said on the recipe, you get the passata already done. You put it in a pot with a little bit of garlic, a little bit of basil. In my case, I also added some cherry tomatoes. OK, right. OK, and it, it, you just bring it up to the boil. So the, the pasta sauce is already done. OK, so And it's you just, just have to mix it together. And then you put some Parmesan cheese on top, OK? Oh, that's that's there's lots of different parts to this, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but it's not as, as much as... And then you put some grated mozzarella and then some fresh mozzarella like that on top oh of it. Oh, my God. OK? Wait, sorry, Alberto, just yeah. with the sauce. So you did garlic, uh, garlic basil, cherry tomatoes and basil. Charlotte tomato. And so you get all the nice flavour of it. And then you kind of you fry them up for a bit and then put the passata on the top. More than fry them, you, you just bring it to the boil okay. and you simmer for about 20 minutes. 20 so all minutes, the flavour okay. of the basil... So then is that like in. a pizza sauce, no? Yeah, well, pizza sauce, remember, we did it here the last yeah. time, the tomato is raw, so oh, as to cook raw. it oh, the dough, yeah. okay? So how long would that go in for? Because now you could... put it five minutes in the oh, oven. Oh, just five minutes, because they've all been cooked. Everything's been cooked not already. Then you put the grill on, and what happens is the you get this beautiful already done. You see all the cheese now is melted oh, on top, and everything is nice and creamy and oh, flavorful as knocking. you would like. Yeah, see? I love getting knocky. And then you out. just dish it out, and you see the mozzarella starts to cool <gasps> and everything. Oh, wow. So this is magical, you know. It, it, it's a nice dish. Very nice. To yes. do for dinner. Look, <laughs> like, Come on. It cannot Hurry be fast enough. <laughs> now, do you put anything on this now? No, no I because there's anything enough. Else, there's no. enough. There's enough there. You know, you could put more cheese, but then it becomes a cheese fest. Mm, well, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. I know, <laughs> but you'll feel it later on. Because it's nearly like when you're seeing it there, it's nearly like you're pulling a pizza apart exactly. as well. 
Uh, and it's nice, hence alla Sorrentina, you know, mm. it's all the, the flavours and all it's, that it's one makes that part it's, it's lovely, it's really good, yeah, really and, nice. And it's light. Yeah, I, lo I love yeah, red gnocchi, I didn't know you could make it that yeah, easy some, just from home. When you buy them, obviously, their consistency will be a bit harder, you know, but yeah. because we make them, Why they're nice, that? soft. It's just because they are made to last in a package for weeks. Oh, yeah. Right. That oh, smelt good. on the mouth. And then exactly. you just like, yeah. put some uh, pa yeah. uh, basil. Some whatever basil, else, and the basil, the basil brings the flavor of summer. Alberto uh, Rossi from the Intercontinental Hotel, thank you so much no for joining us this morning. Absolutely mm. gorgeous. Now, up next, uh, who needs sunny Spain for the Camino when we have our own picturesque trails right here in Tipperary? Uh, yeah, well, we're going to see you, Derek, who's going to be lacing up his boots to explore the beauty in our very own Camino after the wreck. See you in a few minutes. <laughs> Welcome back to Oops. Ireland AM. Oh, sir. Oh. Stand on your toes. Big feet there. Hartigan has been hiking in the Premier County all morning, taking on Tipperary's toughest trail. Yeah, our jack of all trades is discovering why Ireland might have our next Camino. Mm -hmm. Over to you, Derek. Tell us more. Hartigan's hikes. That's a series that's we want to see, guys. Get a commission. Anyway, who needs the Camino in Spain? Because we have tracks and trails down here in Tipperary, all to tie in with St. Declan's Way. Uh, live broadcasting here down in Cairn, the Premier County. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Good morning Jerry. Jerry. Oh, yes, they're all up and active here nice and early this morning. Grony and John, with this Grony, I'm never out of the place. Yeah, I know. You've been here three times three in the last year. Three times. So it's great. It's great to be down here once again with you this morning. Anyway, St. Declan's Way, a fantastic Camino. First up, T tell us about St Declan, who was he? St Declan was based in Ardmore in County Waterford and he uh, came to Cashel in uh, Tipperary to meet St Patrick at the invitation of the hiking of Munster to agree how they would bring Christianity to the Dacia. The Dacia is in the southern part of Ireland and on that trip he walked uh, about 115 kilometres on an ancient path 1500 years ago to get to Cashel and it's in that ancient path that St Declan's Way is now based that still exists now today in 2024. Tell us about the path and the, the Camino itself. Uh, it's, it's 115 kilometres, it can be walked in five to six days. It's a whole mix of different types of landscape, of lovely uh, arable fertile land, the Golden Vale in Tipperary, uh, the Knockmildown Mountains, uh, the beautiful dairying areas of Waterford, and it finishes then at the coast at Ardmore, uh, right on the sea, with some beautiful cliff walks around there. Is it a tough walk, is it a tough hike? It can be challenging in places, but it's not beyond any average walker of average fitness. It, people can take it at their own pace. They can walk for four or five hours a day. They can walk for an hour or two a day, exactly as they want. And it's, it, it doesn't go to too great a height in the mountains. It goes through the mountains rather than over them. So it's a nice, uh, I suppose, challenging walk, but it's something something everybody can, can achieve. Also, weather a major factor, uh, especially looking, it looks like it's going to be a bit choppy into the weekend as well. It is, the weather is a factor, but it's all about dressing for the seasons in this country in having enough with you to deal with the wind and the rain and to be able to really I suppose layer up uh, as you need to and uh, be able to continue to walk despite any weather challenges that might come. <laughs> no such thing as bad weather, it's bad clothes, Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly, Derek. <laughs> exactly. Now, John, you are a chairperson of the National, National, uh, yes. the National Trails around the country. Uh, how many have you got? Well, we've got... Uh, uh, this is the, the longest one here, and it's the nearest thing we have to a Camino, but there are great trails that are shot around the country as well. So I'm sure you've been all over the country. You've been down in Kerry, haven't you? Yeah, I have, uh, yeah. Broadcast. Well, the Cosson and Ave is down there, out on the Dingle Peninsula absolutely wonderful and of course a lot of these trails when I, I we love saying this you know the Camino our trails are about twice as old as the Camino I mean it's a little over a thousand years I always go back to pagan times two towns lost in the midst of history Canuck and one of the finest mountains and a beautiful view a view to die from and that's in South Kerry and then of course the Cork people saying Finbar's Pilgrim Path and it's two days across the Shehi Mountains and then you get this glorious finish I'm sure you've been down there as well you know Gugan Barra you finish down the mountains into Gugan Bar, absolutely. And then for the dubs, we have to have something for them, <laughs> close to them, by something easy for them, as they say down here. So what are we talking about? We're talking about St. Kevin's Way, crossing the Wicklow Mountains. I know that there was 80 people on a walk there last weekend, and I believe that they had to turn away nearly as many more. So it's a huge growth. The Pilgrim Paths of Ireland have come on from being virtually nobody could walk them. Even St. Declan's Way 10 years ago was overgrown. And now we have people, I'm 
talking to a group that are coming in to do St. Declan's and there's 27 of them flying in from LA. And We've got a gorgeous one in Mayo as well. We can't yeah, leave, we can't leave the West End. Oh, I know, yeah, absolutely. The Tower Fari. And of course, Ballon Tower Abbey. And of course, that is the, the real where you connect with the past. Because remember, the path of sail at the present is really creation of the railway. Because that's the side of the mountain the railway was at. But the ancient path, the one we promote, comes into the most glorious countryside that has very has almost not changed since medieval period. And I mean, this is a path that would have been there before St. Patrick. It would have been a pagan path. But of course, uh, Pen Patrick was fairly clever bio. He knew not to throw out the old, you know. So he came along and he put crosses just on the standing stones. Hey, presto, we've got a, a, a Christian path. While well, later the English tried to throw out the old religion, everybody resisted. Patrick knew his marketing even in those days. Yeah, John and Grady, we'll come back to you in a few moments now because we're going to pop down here and say hello to Ellen and Helen. You're the Irish aunt and deck, isn't that it? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> uh, Helen, you've done this walk before. I have indeed. I did it in 2018. And what did you get out of the walk? Um, well, I got fit anyway. Yeah, <laughs> that's a start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was very spiritual and I had loads of friends with me and met lovely people and it was really nice. What about yourself, Ellen? Uh, I've done two legs of the walk, uh, the first one and the last one. I signed up for five, which in other way life intervenes and sometimes <laughs> you have to cancel it again. Yeah, yeah but most enjoyable. And what do you get out of it? Well, I suppose fitness, number one, and friendship, meeting new people, seeing new parts of the country, which is also lovely, p parts you haven't walked in before. I would be generally a walker anyway. And it's lovely, I suppose. It gives you, I suppose, that little bit of headspace as well, doesn't it? Yes, uh, time to think and, I suppose, reflect on life and uh, listen to other people sometimes. There's a little bit of counselling, I think, goes on yes. as you walk along the way as well. Yeah, it, yeah, it's almost like a therapy session in some ways, isn't it, it is. Ellen? Definitely, yeah. definitely. And I'm here today to support these two wonderful ladies. Yeah. Chrissy and Josie. Chrissy and Josie, yeah. they're yeah. still going yeah, here this morning. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's, there's no stopping them. So, I mean, it really is all about, you know, I, I suppose that spiritual journey, but also that gorgeous friendship journey as well, Gronio, right? Exactly. It's about taking time out to be able to leave your troubles behind and to be able to walk to, to appreciate the landscape around you and really focus on, on, on the here and now. You know, rather than being in a car, driving in and out, ticking the, bu the bucket list. I've seen this, I've seen that, I'm going to zoom on again. It's lovely. It's just about enjoying it. Where can we find out more online? stdeclansway.ie. We have an event this weekend, uh, walking from Tipperary, Goaton Bridge, into uh, County Waterford, through Mount Mellory, into Lismore. And then the National Trails, John. The National Trails, pilgrimpath.ie, seven great trails across the country, the perfect way to, to explore. And remember, too, it's slow tourism. Like Ron, you said, it slows down the mind. You always Nobody. feel more relaxed at the end of it. You're, it's wonderful. You're Get really there, selling honest. it to me here. I think I'm going to come this weekend. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, absolutely. From John Gronia, we've Ellen, Helen, Josie and Chrissy, all the gang here, down at Temporary. It's a long way to hear back to you. It's so, um, wonderful. Really, yeah, really man, nice. Uh, yeah, Thank you gorgeous. very much, Derek. Yeah, fair play to good. everybody out there. Brave and uh, looks like it's starting to rain as well. Yeah. So good on you. Great walk, though. Absolutely fantastic. Lovely. Thank you so much for that, Derek. Now, coming up, Italia 90s icon Andy Townsend on the hunt for a new manager for the Republic of Ireland team. Uh, we're going to meet three Irish businesses who are thriving in their craft. We're all staring at everything all, going yeah, on. We're going, going, that's lovely. That. That's lovely. I'm ready Just to try on everything. John dress. Hanley's over there. Look, we're saying they're lovely trust mm -hmm. and best-selling author Carmel Harrington will be paying us a visit so don't go anywhere we'll see you in a few minutes Hello, welcome hey, back. You're very welcome back. I'm just reading through some of the messages, really interesting. We were discussing earlier on about uh, parents. Uh, we were talking about creches, we were talking about a lot of things, but parents uh, and in the workplace, and should they get priority over other workers who don't have kids around Christmas time, Easter time. I'm a bit outnumbered here, so we'll go straight to the text. Yeah. No, but it was very interesting because we thought there'd be about a 50 50, but, but the results on our, on our uh, line said that, on our poll, said no. 77% said no, 23% said yes. So 77% of, uh, of you who have voted this morning were saying no, you shouldn't and get priority. And it's because priority. the parents don't have time to vote, you see. They're all there <laughs> managing 10 children it's going, the people who try to 
old the enough kids to the thing. To... It's all the people with no kids of all the time to oh, be doing that. All the time yeah. to walk up to the all TV, the scan Kira, the time, right? Kira sent us in a text. I'm a nurse. We all take it in turns over the Christmas period, whether we have children or not. It breaks my heart when I have to leave my children on Christmas morning to work a 13-hour oh. shift. However, I wouldn't expect a person with no children to be any different. They have family too. Good on you, Kira. Very and I'm sure a lot of people are the same. Yeah. But it shouldn't be like that, though, Kira, should it? <laughs> she can't talk you through the screen, Tommy. Oh, she can't do it. Aaron, my wife and I have three children. They're under the age of five. And we don't think that parents should get priority for holidays. It was our decision to have children and we knew the implications. People who don't have kids shouldn't be discriminated against. Hold on, Sorry. where's all the messages for the other side? There's none. No, there's there none. Any. Lynn says, I'm a mother of three adult sons, worked all her life managing travel and work and holidays. I don't believe parents should get priority when leave as it can cause resentment Ooh. in the workplace and sour what would have been previously good yeah, relationships. It re causes resentment in the household as well. If you, the, the wife, the husband, the parents, like it, like for, for parents who do have children, we're talking about childcare at the minute and camps, everything is extortionate. So like to take time off over Easter, for instance, for parents, so they can look after the kids so they don't have to pay for it. Would make Tommy, sense. Tommy, that's surely. different, but do you think you're entitled to it well, over no. the priority of somebody who doesn't have well, a child? Well, that's what you're saying. I think it's about having that relationship with it, with your work colleagues or down to a good boss who is able to decide it and be able to actually make these decisions earlier on. Mm. I suppose when you're someone like a guard or a nurse and you've got this standard roster, like they're living uh -huh. in a situation where it's like, well, there's literally nothing that I can do. Yeah. Whether you have children or not, yeah. or you've got a parent at home who needs help, it's like, well, we're stuck with this. Do you know, mm. like there's very little that they can do to change their shifts. Um, um, interesting. Interesting, interesting. All the texts, and to be fair, the poll as well. 72, 77 percent of people saying no that there shouldn't be priority. Tommy likes so, to win, yeah. and he's, he can't believe this poll. He's no, like, there has to be a I reason. Say, the poor parents out there just have too much going on at the minute to be going and voting on an Ireland Day <laughs> poll. I, I feel your pain, <laughs> but that's why I come to work, and it's great. <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, for all do the, know work, what? For all I the want, working Will parents. Lucy come on and have a chat with us Absolutely someday? We'd not. love to have yeah. a 15 minute chat there with Lucy. Go. It'd be fantastic. Uh, now, coming up next, former Republic of Ireland Captain Andy Townsend shares his take on the search for Ireland's new manager. We'll be back after the break. 15 minutes. <laughs> Welcome back to Ireland AM. We have a true icon in our midst. We are all part of Jackie's army. He is a football favourite and a savvy sports commentator. Please welcome Andy Townsend. Hello. Maureen, how are you? It's lovely to have you here. How are you, you doing? I'm very good. Thank you. Very good. All you good. don't change, do you? Like, we're going back to Italia 90 yeah. and you're still just... Oh, I've you're changed still... a bit from the blonde hair's gone. <laughs> it's only just grown out, actually, a couple... No. I've it took a few years a few to get rid years. of the blonde it took hair. took a few years to go, but uh, it's been replaced by a, a different colour now, grey. Uh, salt and pepper. Salt <laughs> and pepper, that's what it is. <laughs> There's been a lot going on in the world of football. I think we have to turn first, of course, to the Republic yes. of Ireland. Yes. Because John O'Shea stepped in into a manager for two games. We lost 1-0 yes. to Switzerland. Yeah. How, how do you feel about it all? Um... Look, I personally, I think it's taking too long and it's taken. Um, um, I, th I just think it's dragged on too far now. Players are, you, w would feel happy, more comfortable if they, if they knew and if they understood who they're going to be working with. The more it drags on for them and then it's thrown upon them at the last minute a little bit and then you're galloping into matches. Whereas I think we had an opportunity here, yes, to get the right man, but to kind of have, have done it by now. Um, so, so I'm a little surprised it's taken as long as it's had. John's had a couple of games, and John is a is is look is clearly going to have a career in in football yeah. management. Um, but uh, but we'll see. I, I I just thought it would have been would have been better by now for everybody concerned if if we had the man in charge. How do you think this reflects on the FAI? Because clearly there is an issue with enticing someone into this role. Fair play yeah. to John O'Shea for stepping up. Yeah, there's a, look, you've got to go through a process. I mean, you can't get rid of Stephen Kenny and then all of a sudden get someone in within 48 hours. That's not right either. Um, it's just that. It feels now to me like it's... I mean, I've been sort of checking the, the, the press on a regular basis over the last few months from 
from over in the UK and expecting to hear something, expecting to see the sort of rumours start to grow where it's going to lead into a certain direction. And that hasn't happened. Well, there was know. one rumour, and we just heard yesterday, Gus <laughs> Poirier, <laughs> yeah. he's gone from Greece. Yes. You know him very well. You I know work Gus. With him. I do have worked with Gus in telly many, many times. He's, look, he's been a... He's, he's certainly... Um, travelled around as a coach and as a, he's experienced, got great personality, Gus. He really has. He's a, he's a, he's a. He was a great player and look has had success in various ways that wherever he's been. He's managed domestically. He's managed in, in good yeah. levels of club football as well as international football. I would be a little surprised if that's going to be the one. I would be a little surprised. Yeah. Because I, I, but you never know. Listen, never say never in football. It's that sort of business. Well, you have been quite vocal in what you want to happen. You have mentioned a certain fella that you used to play with before. Well, I, I, I think Roy still has something to, to offer in terms of football management. Roy Keane. Um, I do. I do. Uh, is, look, he polarises... He would polarise opinion. I think a lot of fans would be right behind him if he, if he got the job. I saw him recently, actually, at a game I was working on and he... Um, Again, I, 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 I know that he still perhaps feels that there's, he's, got, he's got more to do as a manager. I think everyone has kind of always felt that. Mm. And I suppose with the Ireland job, it wouldn't be as full on if he was back, yeah. you know, in the Premier League or the Championship in the UK. But still, he's got incredibly high standards. He has. Do you know, Martin O'Neill said to me, Martin said... it Because they work together, obviously. They were together. Martin said to me, it'd be interesting if uh, someone let Roy get on with it. Now, that's the problem nowadays in terms of whatever you're doing in football nowadays. There's a million eyeballs across it. There's people yeah. above you, alongside you, that, that perhaps you don't always see eye to eye with or agree with. That's, that would probably, that, that's the biggest problem for, for, for Kino is, is suffering all of that. But if people let him get on with it, I think he... I, I see no reason why no one... You can, you can never absolutely uh, hand on heart say that someone's going to be a roaring success. But I see no reason why he couldn't stimulate our boys and, and certainly get them into a better place than they've been recently. Because you, you would have captained him in the World Cup. I did. In 94 did. In, in, in America. In 94, I did. Um, what was that again, like? <laughs> What's well, that experience a, he was like? He was a very different character then, of course, to the one that he became. Yeah. And the one that, you know, we see now. He's actually a very different character off the television screen you know, compared to what everyone sees when he's working at the weekends. He's, you know, Roy's a, he's a family man and he's, a, he's great fun and he's good character, um, which is why I think that you need to have... Someone's got to have something... You've got to have a bit about him. I want to see the next Island manager to have a, a bit of personality, a yeah. bit of something. Look, Jack had that. He always had that kind of little sparkle, that little twinkle in his eye. He had something else that, um, that people could could kind of go with and follow with. And I think we need that. Didn't you all have kind of a sparkle and twinkle in your eye? That's a great <laughs> picture of you. Because I was listening to a podcast recently about Italian 90. Yes. Like this great cultural moment yes. in Ireland's football history. The pinnacle that we've had so far. Yes. But my God, Andy, you, you worked hard and played hard. Oh, we just certainly did. We, we, you know, that, that, was, that was rule number one. Um, in fact, when, I first, when, when, I, when Jack first approached me, he said to me, do you like a drink? And, and uh, sorry, you know, <laughs> he said, because if you do, he said, you'll be great in our camp. And, uh, and look, you know, that he encouraged, he encouraged us to, to enjoy the moment. Yeah. He encouraged us, you know, within reason. I mean, we used to sneak out a little bit here and there, but mm -hmm. he, he would encourage us with, to, to make sure that we really enjoyed being together and being part of something that was emerging and something that was growing. Because it's so interesting with this. In listening to this podcast, there's that thing, remember when Gaza burst into tears yes. in Italia 90 yes. and it became a huge talking point. Mm. Like, how could he? You know, mm. he's a man and there was all this thing. What, mm. what do you make of the game and, and how it's changed? Because obviously mm. sport is a way that men come together. Yes. But it was such a hard man sort of a sport, soccer. Yes. And we kind of need, we need it. Do we need it to soften? Do we need lads to well, have more, be able to have more emotion? Yes, we do. I mean, part of the reason why I'm here with Three Island and Aware have extended their partnership for a couple of years to encourage people. This talk more than football campaign. The Vinnie Jones, my old teammate Vinnie at Chelsea, is going to launch that tom uh, tomorrow on all the social media platforms. You can catch all of them 
on three. So, uh, so yeah, that's all part of the reason why why I'm here today. It has changed so much. The dressing room in my day was one where you weren't encouraged to bring any problems in. The way yeah. you sorted your problems out was the mirror, maybe talking to your to your wife as you switched the light off at night. That was about it. There was no there was no uh, there was no time for yeah. for that really. Whereas, look, come on, the world's moved on. We've all moved on. We all understand every single one of us has issues, has problems. Believe you me, football is amazing. It's wonderful, but it's not without its problems. Mm. It's not without its issues. It, it's not easy, like all walks of life. Um, people have this kind of perception of football as being, you know, the, the absolute lifestyle that everybody would want. Yes, it's got some great parts to it, but it's got a lot of issues too. Yeah. And so, so I think now we're at this moment now where it's time to, to not be afraid to talk about your issues, to get them out in the open. There are professionals that can help you. There are ways that you can find yourself coming out of a, of a hole and moving forward. Yeah. But you have to start talking about it, which is why the emphasis is on talk more than football. It's not just about the game, it's yeah. about other things. But it's a great start, jumping off point for people, right? It kind of is. Kind of sitting there having a chat about something that happened the weekend it and is. you can get into You know, and else. lots of, particularly men, young men go into football, groups, groups yeah. of lads that meet up, they go to the pub, they have a beer, they go to football. They don't really want to talk about that, actually. And that, that's all part of this, that we're encouraging everybody to do so. You do feel better about yourself if a problem is shared or... Uh, is spoken about. Yeah. You know, you do. Uh, you're a liar if you if you say you don't. So it's time now to sort of to to, to be brave enough to front all that up and and speak about it. I have a chat. Uh, it's uh, the hashtag Talk More Than Football campaign with Three and Aware. Yes. Um, it is lovely chat. The eyes are thank just you. as blue in real life, lads. You know, they're <laughs> piercing. Andy Townsend, thank you so much. Thank for you. Chance. Thanks so much. Lots more to come on Ireland AM. We'll see you after the break. Now, this morning, we're championing some amazing Irish companies. And first up is a business born out of a challenge posed by a friend. sally Ann, good morning to good you. Morning. How are you? Tell us the challenge. What was the challenge that led to this? Uh, my best friend, Katie, said that she thought that I should be able to make a bag. And uh, so... Why did she think that? Well, there's four generations of my family can sew, and she seemed to think if anybody could sew... <laughs> you could make me. a bag. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I did. I... I got some fabric and then I realised that I needed to line it. So I cut up my husband's jeans and made a bag. And, and that's something that's carried on with all your bags and all your clothes is that recyclable and sustainability yeah. is a huge thing for you. Yeah, I wanted the business to be sustainable. I'm, I'm the opposite of fast fashion. Mm. It's slow, considered and it's sustainable. So every bag has recycled jeans on the so inside. So from your husband's first pair of jeans, you've, you led this into the business. So all this, is, yeah, everything inside is jeans, recycled yes. jeans. Yes, yeah, I try and recycle as much as I can. So I use the belt loops from the jeans to sew in a key clip. I use the pockets on the, the backpacks. Like even on this, is, look, yeah. there's the pocket there. And I take the zips out when I get the chance and I make little coin purses with the offcuts of the outer fabric. So again, I'm reusing as much as I possibly can of the, the, the fabrics. F a fantastic idea. And like when you look at them, they're so colourful and the flowers. And this is all inspired from like your, where you're living. It's just the flowers around you in County Clare. Yeah, I, I love my flowers and West Clare has beautiful flowers and they, they are the inspiration for all of my prints. Um, so you can see there's, there's poppies. They were ones that were growing in my driveway and my husband was about to hoe them out and I stopped him and took pictures and that was where they came from. And just where, where, how many pairs of jeans do you need and where do you get the jeans then? Because if you're making so many bags... <laughs> I get through um, probably about two, three hundred pairs a year minimum and I get them all from the Irish Wheelchair Association in oh, Ennis. Really? They are phenomenal. They, they put them aside for me when I ask them. Um, Mags is my hero yeah. and uh, she puts them aside and gets me, puts them in a great big bin. I go through, sort them all out and get everything I need and they get money, I get jeans. It's and you're, really able, you're able to do this. Yeah. Now, I know, how does Guaranteed Irish then help you and help the business? Guaranteed Irish is a huge network and it's been a real support to me. I only joined this year. Um, encouraged by my husband who remembered as a child going round Duns um, with his mother and her, her saying, 
go for the go for yeah, the G, go. look for the G. And he said, you know, that this would be really good. And the support has been fantastic. And also the sense of community, guaranteed Irish companies try and give back to their community, mm. which is great. Because um, you have your own, you've, you go to a market in Ennis? Yes, my, my colleague Lorna and I, we, um, we, we run Chapel Lane Market in Ennis every Saturday. Um, and that's really important to bring through the next generation of crafters and hopefully the next generation of guaranteed Irish. And it's something that we all love to go and see, isn't it? Like yeah. when there's a market, we are all there. We're always yeah. there. <laughs> How can people find out more about you and see your bags in more detail? Well, I'm uh, going to be at Chapel Lane Market hopefully on Saturday. This um, coming Saturday. This coming Saturday. I'll be at Farmley House on, in Dublin on Sunday. Um, and I'm online at sallyannsbags.com. Sallyannsbags.com, so people can find out more. Well, congratulations, and they look beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Tommy. Thank you very much, Alan. Yes, I am joined by a fifth generation of a business that was established back in 1893. John Hanley. The John Hanley is here. Uh, John Hanley's the business back in 1893. You are a part of the fifth generation of a family uh, with the same name. How does, that's pretty cool, isn't it? It is pretty cool, I guess. Uh, for me, I'm probably a bit more embarrassed about it nearly in ways, uh, but no, it is nice. Uh, it's great that uh, we've been making for so long. We've been making uh, for over 130 years. Uh, it's so nice to, I suppose, be into the fifth generation and I suppose like, I suppose we're always looking forward and we're always afraid of what's ahead of us. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I suppose we want to continue it on. Another 130 years is probably a bit ambitious, but uh, definitely would like to see it into the next well, generation. It's just such a success story. A family, homegrown Irish business producing produce here in Ireland, making everything uh, in Nina as well. What is it that you do in John Hanley? So we make a, a wide range of products. It's, um, ma we make uh, woolen throws, blankets, scarves, headwear, and uh, we also make fabric. Uh, the business originally would have uh, made fabric and sold to the rag trade. Uh, okay. that, that all changed dramatically when people, I suppose, started to dress down. Mm. Um, and I suppose then we had to adapt. And in the last 20 years, we have gone into the accessories and we've made throws, designed quality throws, blankets, baby blankets, as you can see here, uh, scarves, headwear. And we continue to do so with new quality designs every year. Like that's it, because businesses, they have to adapt. And we're seeing particularly in this industry, a lot of companies moving east because of cost uh, implications and shops as well. But having it made in Ireland, there's something special about that. And particularly over COVID, I'm sure you saw a massive boost to people wanting to support you. Yeah, no, true COVID. And uh, unfortunately, we were, we were dealt a double blow with Brexit. I think people uh, place a bigger focus on made in Ireland and trying to identify where your products come from and uh, the source of it. I think when people got a, a little customs bill in through yeah. the post, they were like, OK, next time I better check where I'm getting my product from. And I think that has helped us. And it is very important. And uh, I suppose supporting Irish and the, it is something that, I suppose it's very, very important to us as an Irish business. And being part of this guaranteed Irish, I'm sure it helps as well. Like, are people able to buy it online? Are there shops around the country? Where can people avail of it? Yeah, um, you can buy our product on uh, www.johnhanley.com, but also guaranteed Irish, very important to us. Um, we, I think that we epitomise guaranteed Irish in that we are not only supporting Irish jobs, but we are also uh, making in Ireland and we have a fantastic team and staff and workforce back in Nina who work tirelessly to uh, create and make these products every day and uh, a big thank you to them. Without them, it's not po uh, possible for us. Well, it gets my seal of approval as well, Good, John. I'm glad, Tommy. Uh, and I know you came home from Australia to come be part of the business as well. The fifth generation, absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for joining us on that. And uh, this looks pretty good. What do you reckon, Warren? Like a Leinster supporter over oh, there, is it? Off. <laughs> it's off. It's off. <laughs> um, now, I am also talking guaranteed Irish today, and I am delighted to be joined by a woman who appears Itemizes bridal fashion. It is the wonderful Sharon Hoey. Hello. Thank you. Hello. How are you? Very good. Thank Normally you. associate you with gorgeous mm. white and ivory gowns. That's what most people, I think, think. Yes. Sharon Hoey bridal. I now know. you have branched out to Anne Tate. Tell me about it. OK, well, I actually started in fashion, like, all those decades ago, and then we had to sort of pivot, I think, in the 90s to bridal. So this has always been 
in the background. Um, it really was, I suppose, the search for the perfect white shirt for my uh, son's uh, girlfriend, maybe my daughter-in-law in the future, who knows, but anyway. <laughs> She'll be getting uh, a bridal dress too. <laughs> um, so I realised that really there wasn't, there wasn't much out there. So uh, we Is put... That, that's because women's white shirts are made differently to men's yes, white shirts. Yes, yes, you've been doing your homework on my website. Yes, Why yes, yes. So... Men's shirts, the cotton is a, it's a sturdier twist okay. so that it'll wash more. You know, women's collars all sort of fade away and crumple. So we just wanted to do everything in a way like a man's shirt and sort of started with very beautiful Italian formal cottons. Yeah. But, you know, unfortunately, we launched them in Paris and then unfortunately, uh, COVID. COVID. Yeah, COVID. so COVID came. But then you diversified because it's well, not just shirts. You have yeah. gone all out. Tell us about these gorgeous well, clothes. Well, we're only in colour a year. So we what were, yeah, we were black, black and white. So started with black and white shirts. Then it was sort of black separates. And then it was only this time last year, more or less, at Showcase that we introduced a little bit of colour to, to lift the stand more than anything else. Look at you. Is that what you're yeah, wearing in black? I'm wearing in black. And this is the navy. So it's yeah. casualed up. Casualed up. So it's not just for events. You know, you can wear it uh, to various different, various different things. Into work with a sweater like me or with a kind of... With a pair of jeans. With a pair of jeans or a little pair of capri pants, white How kitten heels. How do you find the more kind of the more casual side of it? Because you've been working with women for yeah. decades. Decades. Yeah, more decades than I really should be saying. Would you stop? <laughs> but how, like, how is it when you're kind of like, hi, gals, I've got some, I've got some lighter stuff for you. It's yeah, not just no, all formal wear. Yeah, no, no, it's great. And I, and, I think, and I want people to wear our garments. I don't want them just stuck in the wardrobe. I want them yes. to be able to take them out and to wear them and wear them, you know, to different events. I mean, you could wear this to a garden party or you could wear it to a black tie wedding or you could wear it to a ball. You know? It's the atonement so, colour. Yes, that dress from atonement. Yes, it's unbelievable. Yes. Um, you you involved in Guaranteed Irish as well. Yes, I am. With Anne yes. Tate. With Anne Tate. And uh, with Anne Tate. They're telling me in my ear I can put this down. I don't want to put it down. I just want to hold it on like this. With Anne Tate and with Sharon Hoey. I mean, both, both, both our brands are made in Ireland. And Guaranteed Irish, I've only been a member for about a year. But, you know, the organisation, the network is fantastic. And... Um, I just think as a supporter of Irish fashion, you know, Guaranteed Irish has been superb because there's not too many supporters of Irish fashion out there, you know. And it's so amazing yeah. to kind of, to have that Guaranteed sign, as yeah. everyone has said. Yeah. It does feel very special because you make and design these in your studio. I do, and we make everything in Ireland. So, you know, we're giving jobs. You know, we've employed people for, what, 30-odd years, you know. That's amazing. Like, that's just amazing what it is mm. that you're mm. able to... To do. And You're... I think Guaranteed Irish gives you a platform as well, you know, to be able to... <laughs> I'm just going to keep throwing up stuff. Will we just keep on looking at stuff like this? Sharon Hoey, it is a pleasure to meet you. Thank, Thank you, you so you much for coming in and showing us all of these gorgeous things. You'll be able to find out more, of course, on all of these websites and Guaranteed Irish. Up next, author Carmel Harrington stops by to tell us about her latest book. We'll talk to you shortly. Welcome back. Now, our next guest is a best-selling author who, whose books have been sold around the world and translated into eight different languages. Uh, joining us now to talk about her latest book, The, Light, the Lighthouse Secret, is author Carmel Harrington. Good morning to you, Carmel. Good and morning. When we morning. Say, when we say best-selling author yeah. and world-renowned, yes. and Maren's going, yes, but she is. When you look <laughs> at it, though, um, sold in 11 territories, eight languages. Like, <laughs> for somebody who was hiding her first books under her mattress... This must be huge. It is huge. And you know, it's when you see your book translated, it does give you, I don't make you feel like a proper author. <laughs> I don't know what it is about seeing Into your name. another language. In another language. There's something about is that. Is it weird when you're looking at it, it like is. that? It is. It's weird and wonderful. It is really, you get a kick out of it. And I love seeing those editions when they come through. And it's interesting to see how they change the title slightly. Oh, yeah. And how your name is, like how Harrington is in a different language. Um, oh, of course. You never is. think of that. It's kind of interesting. And then... And then it was a real kick, like obviously to be a bestseller in America because like that's a territory that yes, we huge. all kind of want to conquer. So yeah. that, I think that was a firework moment for me, you know, in my career. It is a huge territory. Can we go back to the books underneath the bed? What's, what's, what's... Oh, I was a devil. I don't know. I really was quite scared about 
telling anybody that I was writing books. So I had two books written and literally they were, as under, Alan said, they were under, under the, bed. the bed. Like they were. And my husband said to me, he said, you can't, <laughs> we'll have no room under the bed. You can't keep, <laughs> you can keep writing books. You're going to have to show it's, someone. It's propping up the mattress <laughs> at this stage. Just, <laughs> you have to show someone. It was crazy. But it was actually Amelia was, um, she's 14. So it's 14 years ago. So she was a couple of months old and I was on maternity leave because I was a sales and marketing manager doing a very different job but writing kind of whenever I wasn't working yeah or party maybe a little bit um but I remember looking at Amelia and she was in her cot and she was fast asleep and I was having one of those lovely mother moments you know where you're mm. kind of dreaming about maybe what her possibilities in her future would be and I was wishing all sorts in my mind for her and then I thought you're such a fraud Harrington because here you are with two books written under your bed and you're too scared to show them to anyone in case they don't like it. And I thought, that's not really what I want for my children. So I walked out to my husband and I said, I'm going to go for it. But Carmen, do you know <laughs> what's fantastic. lovely as well? And I think anybody <laughs> watching this morning in this, in writing books, in acting or anything like that, how many rejections did you get from agents? Oh, 47. 47, yeah. It was fun. Like, <laughs> I had, isn't I, that just amazing yeah. though, where people would just go, well, just I'm just going to give up then. But you know what, Alan? I always say this to other writers if they ask me for, you know, for advice or whatever. And I just say to them, you only need one yes. That's mm. all you yeah. need. And when I got my one yes, within three months, I had a book deal with HarperCollins. See. So it happened really quickly. Yeah. Once I had put in the kind of, you know, the hard work. And it's hard. Like, it's not easy. It's, it isn't easy to kind of, when you get a no and you kind of feel like going, oh, yeah. Maybe I'll leave it. Mm, exactly. Um, but then I just kept, I really, my children did kind of um, inspire me and they go mad now me saying this, but they did. I kind of wanted to do, for I them. wanted to show them that you can dust yourself off and keep going for it. That's, you know. That's absolutely fantastic. Mm. Do you know yeah. what? It's lovely to hear that. Oh, and you. my God, do people go gobble up your books. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, in a week people have them done. Yeah. Tell us about your latest book. It's The Lighthouse Secret. Yeah. Guess what? Full of intrigue, lads. Yeah, there's a lot of mystery in this. There one, is a it? lot, yeah. Yeah, there's mysteries in both the kind of the past and the present. Yeah. It's set between Ballycotton and East Cork. And if you haven't been there, I feel like I'm on the tourist board, but I really, <laughs> I keep talking about it, but it is a stunning coast. And you village. write it the country, beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. It's just gorgeous. Um, so it's set between there and Maine in New England. And it's between 1951 and the present day. And the story starts in 1951 with four lighthouse keepers wives who are making a vow never to tell about the crime that they've committed the previous day. And then, of course, someone does tell because it wouldn't be a book if somebody didn't yeah. tell. Mm -hmm. But 70 years later, the granddaughter of one of those keepers' wives receives an anonymous letter saying, family secrets never stay buried. And she's a TV presenter. She's a TV presenter, very like you two, very glamorous. <laughs> and she's a on a TV show. TV a breakfast TV yeah, show. A breakfast TV show. she's a yeah. breakfast TV show Very, presenter. very popular, very much beloved. And in fact, so she, not us then. <laughs> yes, well, she she goes on. Her name is Molly Kenefick, and she's wonderful. Actually, she's very glamorous. And I have to say, like I know you've read the book, but yeah. she, she has a little bit of you. I have to say, oh, she, no, does. she does. She oh, does. She kind of has your head. She does genuine. But I loved writing Molly, Inspired. and she's a great character. She really is. She's she, a she's kind of multi layered as well. And she has a lot going on. She's a lot going on. I kind of wanted because one of the themes in the story, apart from the intrigue and the mysteries, yeah, I did want to kind of look at the societal ex expectation to have children in the yeah. 50s. So Beth, who's 17 in 1951, it's kind of a coming of age story for her because everybody expects her to do as her mother did and get married to a lighthouse keeper and start oh, yeah. having children. Yeah. And a circus comes to town and her head is turned. Oh, and it. it's kind of her really trying to, she's watched, she's lived in lighthouses her whole life mm. and she's watched the horizon and watched ships sail over them. And she wants to see what's yeah. on the other side of that horizon. Um, but equally in the present day, Molly, who is the um, breakfast presenter, the TV presenter. Her granddaughter, yeah. Um, her, that's Beth's granddaughter. And in the present day, she's asking herself the question whether she wants to start a family or not. And her husband does. So it's quite nice to tease apart the same subject yeah. mm. for very different generations. Exactly. It's also interesting of, of what we know about our parents and our grandparents yeah. and their multi-layered lives that as children, you're like, sure, they don't have anything going on. I know. But in this, there's just other lives that we don't think about, isn't it? Well, I found that really fascinating because there is a mother and daughter relationship in 1951. Beth, as I said, is 17. Mm. And her mother, Kathleen, who's mm. 37. But Beth thinks that she's old. Beth thinks that, that her mother Kathleen is old at 37. At 37, but when, yeah, but and, and 51, it, 1951, it's, it's, 37 was, was old. Cons considered old. Yeah, and so she kind of thinks she'll never understand my wants and desires. She'll never get it. But of course, Kathleen at 37 is a vibrant woman with her own wants and yes, desires and yeah. does get it. 
And I found that interesting myself because my mum and I have the same age gap as Beth and Kathleen. Mum was very young when she had me. And when I remember when I was 17 and mum mentioned something about a previous boyfriend and I was like, what? Excuse, Excuse me? Excuse me, you had a life before my yeah. father and I couldn't believe it. And um, I saw my mother in kind of a new light. So I did kind of use some of my own experiences with my in own that. mother in this. It's really well, well done. The it's lighthouse well secret. Done. The queen of emotional Irish fiction. Well, yeah. Don't That's what she is. <laughs> the brand new one from Carmel Harrington, as always. Lovely, Lovely to see to you. look see fantastic. Thank, Thank you so much. much. You. Brand new one. It is out now. Make sure you get your hands on it. Uh, coming up tomorrow on Ireland AM, a trio of male celebrity royalty. <laughs> Architect Dermot Bannon, comedian Jason Byrne, and fashion designer Don O'Neill will be stopping by. All at the same, All at the same time. time. What Jason are they doing? Byrne will be causing havoc, You'll no doubt. The and if it's not too much to test her own for you, there's uh, spring florals on the catwalk. Uh, and Derek is travelling back 65 million years to the time <laughs> of dinosaurs. There we go. That poor fella. Oh. She's imagining the mileage on that. Yeah, have a, have a great weekend.